Clockwork, a preface. In the old days, when this story took place, time used to run by clockwork, real clockwork. I mean, springs and cogwheels and gears and pendulums and so on. When you took it apart, you could see how it worked and how to put it together again. Nowadays, time runs by electricity and vibrating crystals of quartz and goodness knows what else. You can even buy a watch that's powdered by a solar panel and set itself several times a day by picking up a radio signal and never runs a second late. Clocks and watches like that might as well work by witchcraft for all the sense I can make of them. Real clockwork is quite mysterious enough. Taking a spring, for instance, like the mainspring of an alarm clock. It's made out of tempered steel with an edge that's sharp enough to draw blood. If you play about it with it carelessly, it will spring up and strike you like a snake and put out your eye. Or take away that kind of iron weight that drives the mighty clocks they have in church towers. If your head were under the weight, and if the weight fell, it would dash out your brains on the floor. But with the help of a few gears and pins, and a little balance wheel oscillating to and fro, and a pendulum swinging from side to side, the strength of the spring and the power of the weight are led harmlessly through the clock to drive the hands. And once you wound up a clock, there's something frightful in the way it keeps on going on its own relentless pace. Its hand moves steadily around the dial as if it had a mind of its own. Tick tock, tick tock. Bit by bit they move and tick us steadily on towards the grave. Some stories are like that. Once you've wound them up, nothing will stop them. They move on forwards till they reach their destined end. And no matter how much the characters would like to change their fate, they can't. This is one of those stories. And now, it's all wound up. We can begin. Part 1 Once upon a time, when time ran by clockwork, a strange event took place in a little German town. Actually, it was a series of events, all fitting together like the parts of a clock. And although each person saw a different part, no one saw the whole of it. But here it is, as well as I can tell it. It began on a winter's evening when the townsfolk were gathering in the White Horse Tavern. The snow was blowing down from the mountains and the wind was making the bells shift restlessly in the church tower. The windows were steamed up, the stove was blazing brightly, Putsy, the old black cat was snoozing on the hearth, and the air was full of the rich smells of sausage and sauerkraut, of tobacco and beer. Gretel, the little barmaid, the landlord's daughter, was hurrying to and fro with foaming mugs and steaming plates. The door opened, and fat white flakes of snow were swirled in. To faint away into water as they met the heat of the parlour, the incomers, Herr Ringelman, the clockmaker, and his apprentice, Karl, stamped their boots and shook the snow off their great coats. It's Herr Ringelman, said the borough master. Well, old friend, come and drink some beer with me, and a mug for young what's-his-name, your apprentice. Karl the apprentice nodded his thanks and went to sit by himself in a corner. His expression was dark and gloomy. What's the matter with young thingamajig? said the borough master. He looks as if he swallowed a ton thundercloud. Oh, I shouldn't worry, said the old clockmaker, sitting down at the table with his friends. He's anxious about tomorrow. His apprenticeship is coming to an end, you see. Ah, oh, of course, said the burglar master. It was the custom that when a clockmaker's apprentice finished his period of service, he made a new figure of the great clock of Glockenheim. So, we're here to have a new piece of clockwork in the tire. Well, I look forward to seeing it tomorrow. I remember when my apprenticeship came to an end, said Herr Ringelman. I couldn't sleep thinking about what would happen when my figure came out of the clock. Supposing I hadn't counted the cocks properly, Supposing the spring was too stiff. Supposing, oh, a thousand things go through your mind. It's a heavy responsibility. 
Maybe so, but I've never seen the lad look so gloomy before, said someone else. And he's not a cheerful fellow at the best of times. And it seemed to the other drinkers that Herr Ringelman himself was a little downhearted, but he raised his mug with the rest of them and changed the conversation to another topic. I hear young Fritz, the novelist, is coming to read us his new story tonight, he said. So I believe, said the burgomaster. I hope it's not as terrifying as the last one he read to us. Do you know, I woke up three times that night and found my hair on end, just thinking about it. I don't know if it's more frightening hearing them here in the parlour or reading them later on your own, said someone else. It's worse on your own, believe me, said another. You can feel the ghostly fingers creeping up your spine, and even when you know what's going to happen next, you can't help jumping when it does. Then they argued about whether it was more terrifying to hear a ghost story when you didn't know what was going to happen, because it took you by surprise. Or when you did, because there was the suspense of waiting for it. They all enjoyed ghost stories, and Fritz's in particular, for he was a talented storyteller. The subject of their conversation, Fritz the writer himself, was a cheerful-looking man, who had been eating his supper at the other end of the parlour. He joked with the landlord, he laughed with his neighbours, and when he'd finished, he called for another mug of beer, gathered up the untidy pile of manuscript behind his plate, and went to talk to Carl. Hello, old boy, he said cheerfully. All set for tomorrow? I'm looking forward to it. What are you going to show us? Carl scowled and turned away. The artistic temperament, said the landlord wisely. Drink up your beer and have another on the house in honour of tomorrow. Put poison in and I'll drink it in then, muttered Carl. What? said Fritz, who could hardly believe his ears. The two of them were sitting right at the end of the bar, and Fritz moved so to turn his back on the rest of the company and speak to Carl in private. What's the matter, old fellow? he went on quietly. You've been working at your masterpiece for months. Surely you're not worried about it. It can't fail. Carl looked at him with a face full of savage bitterness. I have a lady figure, he muttered. I couldn't do it. I failed, Fritz. The clock will chime tomorrow and everybody will be looking up to see what I've done and nothing will come out. Nothing. He groaned softly oh, and turned away. I can't face them, he went on. I should go and throw myself over the tower now and have done with it. Oh, come on, don't talk like that, said Fritz, who'd never seen his friend so bitter. You must have word with old Herr Ringelman. Ask his advice. Tell him you hit us now. He's a decent, decent old fellow. He'll help you out. You don't understand, said Carl passionately. Everything's so easy for you. You just sit at your desk and put pen to paper and stories come pouring out. You don't know what it is to sweat and strain for hours on end, with no ideas at all, or to struggle with materials that break, and tools that go blunt, or to tear your hair out trying to find a new variation on the same old theme. I tell you, Fritz, it's a wonder I haven't blown my brains out long before this. Well, it won't be long now. Tomorrow morning you can all laugh at me. Call the failure. Carl the hopeless, Carl the first apprentice to fail in hundreds of years of clock making. I don't care, I shall be lying at the bottom of the river under the ice. Fritz had, had to stop himself interrupting when Carl spoke about the difficulty of working. Stories are just as hard as clocks to put together. They can go wrong just as easily, and we shall see with Fritz's own story in a page or two. Still, Fritz was an optimistic, and Carl was a pessimist, and that makes all the difference in the world. Putsy the cat, waking from his snooze in the hut, came and rubbed his back against Carl's legs. Carl kicked him away, stepped savagely away. Steady on, said Fritz, but Carl only scowled. He drank deeply and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand before banging the mug on the counter and calling for more. Gretel, the young barmaid, looked anxiously at Fritz, 
because she was an only child and wasn't sure whether she should be serving someone in Carl's condition. Give him some more, said Fritz. He's not drunk, poor fellow. He's unhappy. I'll keep an eye on him. Don't you worry. So Gretel poured some more beer for Carl, and the clockwork has made Prince scowled and turned away. Fritz was worried about him. They couldn't stay there any longer, because the patrons were calling for him.